Chapter 6 The Snow on the Forest Kermorvan took what Elof had to tell him with great calm. It could not have been otherwise. I should have trusted what my heart told me. They are too real, too alive, these great folk of old. His eyes shone bright as a child's. And it is given to me to walk among them, to speak with them, to dwell with them. He shook his head in sheer wonder. To dwell with them, Elof echoed him, his voice even and quiet. You trust Hapiao, then? You are determined to do as he wishes? Hardly, said Kermorvan hastily. Not so soon. Many questions must be answered. But how will I do that, save by staying here a while? I dare not neglect such a chance. I would be failing my folk if I did. And on the face of it, this place is truly fair. Looking round, Elof had to agree. It was late afternoon, for all the travelers had slept far into the day, himself longest of all. The warm sun shone golden on the walls of stone and wood, and even he found himself admiring their no noble symmetry, the graceful sweep of the shingled roofs above them, and the richly colored carvings and reliefs that covered so many of them, hitherto hidden by the darkness. High about the outer walls coursed carven tangles of foliage like petrified creepers, delicate yet strong, their intricate coils and snaring graceful hearts, whose heads, whose lifted heads strained forever after leaves that would never bend. All around this tower's winding stair, a dragon wound its coils and clasping wings, only to throw back its head in agony near the summit, where a warrior's sword had pierced it through. By contrast, about the balcony crowning the tower, the heavenly bodies danced a graceful saraband. Round the inner walls of the great court itself, immense sweeps of painted waves arose in low relief. Across them silhouettes of proud ships glided, a fleet of great majesty with the sunrise behind their sails. But on the rear wall, a gale seemed to sweep through the grain of the wood. The waters were storm-tossed, breaking against the very eaves, the sky dark with clouds. On all the angry ocean, one shape alone was seen, a tall, dark figure battling with the ragged sail of a small boat. However unwillingly, Elof was in sympathy with Kermorvan. He, of all men, could not easily seek out evil among such evident craft and care and love of fair things. And his first fears had received a sharp setback, as a group of guardians appeared to bring food. They no longer seemed so weird to him, so unnatural. Their long limbs and strange hands and feet were simply different, shaped by and for their tree-born lives as he would shape his tools. As well hate the sleekness of a seal, because the sea shaped it, or the large wise I, wise eyes of the Duergar in the shadows under stone. And among the guardians, he was startled to see their old folk and their children. These were of all ages from infants to youth and very fair in their fashion. The sun ran molten bronze in their hair and their freckled skins and set green lights dancing in their wide eyes. They were livelier than their elders and a merry word could often win a shy smile, as Tenvar soon found out. And through them, the adults lost some of their reserve and would talk. To Elof, the childlike quality Corentin had mentioned seemed more an alert but unformed intelligence, verging on the animal in its disregard of all but things immediate or imminent. Even the oldest, with lined faces and graying hair, seemed no less casual and heedless than the young. The coming feast was all they cared about, at which they would be both servers and guests. They seemed to find equal delight in both, and would talk of little else in their harsh, gusty voices. So ere long Elof left them, 
and went to lie in the shade and clear his troubled mind. That the guardians should have children and grow old accorded very ill with his first wild guesses about this castle, and left him muddled and unsure. All that day long the travelers rested, eating and drinking as they would. Quarantine came to see that they had all that they wished, but otherwise left them to themselves. They slept as well once more, and on the morrow rose again as late as they pleased. The guardians showed them sweet springs and pools around the hillside beneath the tower where they might bathe. Though the water was cold as the rock it flowed from, it cleansed them of the taints of travel and brought a tingling life back to stiff limbs. On their return, their old garments were gone. Laid out in their place was rich garb of the fashion the castle folk wore. Elof was startled to see the black tunic and hose of a smith laid out for him, the more so as they were heavily woven with thread of silver and gold about wrist and collar. A pattern of characters and symbols he found strangely familiar. Yet it was not until he ran his fingers over the meshed bullion that he remembered. He fetched from his pack the ancient crook-tipped rod of bronze he had once used as a cattle goad, and which he guessed must once have been something more. He stared in astonishment at the semblance of the characters before him. They were the same as on the rod, and in the same order. Only the arrangement was different. The pattern laid out round the collar and repeated in two halves at the wrists. Black distrust welled up in him once more. Had he not set some of these characters upon the mind sword itself? That dark distortion of his inborn craft? Those characters had channeled virtues of compulsion and command. With narrowed eyes, he stared hard at the broideries, but could see no shimmer of living light deep within them. Nor could his fingers trace out in them the thrill of presence that lay within the rod, which was, after all, as it should be. The more potent the pattern, the more bound it was to the material and shape it was meant for, and if transferred or copied, it should be meaningless. Tentatively, he lifted the tunic and drew it slowly over his head. He relaxed as he felt no influence, no trace of difference come over him. But in smoothing the material down, his fingers told him one more truth. It was not new. It had been worn before and trimmed to his stature. What smith had passed that way before him? worried about him as a token that strange patterning. And where was he now? One by one, the others of the company appeared in their finery, some uneasy, some, like Tenvar, positively strutting. But every head turned when Ills appeared in a billowing gown of white curdled with silver, for nothing could have contrasted more with her habitual black jerkin and breeches or kilt. Its flowing line lessened the square Duergar frame and set off her curly black hair and her sparkling eyes. Tenvar went so far as attempting to kiss her hand before he caught the dangerous gleam in her eye and thought better of it. Only Kermorvan was missing, and Elof was about to remark on that when footsteps sounded on the upper stair. Into the gallery stepped Corentin. About his shoulders, tunic and heavy mantle blue as dark seas. And with him, Kermorvan, clad exactly as he, but in green. About their heads were fillets of gold set with gems. About their throats, collars like ropes of rare metals wrought and twisted. To Elof's eye, those jewels shimmered and flashed like sunlit water. Strong virtues dwelt in them, that wove about their wearers an enhancement of their kingliness and power. The guardians hid their eyes as from the sun, and made obeisance. After a moment, Elof and the other travelers bowed also, 
and when at that night's dinner the two lords led the travelers down the steps into the hall of the tree, a loud fanfare and music of instruments heralded their coming, and the whole lordly company bowed as reeds to the imperious winds. All the travelers were seated at Corrington's own table, set now upon a high dais beneath the tree. On the right of his tall chair he placed Kermorvan, beside him the Lady Terrace, and on the left side Elof and Ills. There was much ceremonial about the dinner, hut little solemnity. The talk was soon flowing merrily enough, not least when Guise and Morau Ladin holding forth on hunting. Only Elof was silent, gazing around at the bright folk of the court, trying to imagine the burden of a thousand years of memories in his own mind. Was there enough of any man to fill such a space of lifetimes? It felt almost beyond his understanding, like so much else in this place, and that irked him. He could not accept it as blindly as the others seemed to. He must keep his distance from it, study it as dispassionately as some trial piece simmering at his forge fire. Then he would judge it, not before. But his dark thoughts were interrupted by Corentin, pouring wine for him and smiling in his wise way, which disarmed all ire. Well, Sir Smith, this is very old wine. Will you not try it? Your new garb becomes you well. I trust it is to your measure. Very well, my lord. But if you will forgive the question, whose was it once? Ha ha ha, chuckled Corentin. So you noticed that. I hope you were not offended. From what I hear of you, he would have counted it an honor to have you wear it. Now what was his name? A friend, and it escapes me shamefully. Tharv, that was it. Tharv, a northerner as you are by your speech, and a man commanding a boundless craft and skill. Why, even Lord Vade respected him, who was himself a great smith. It was Tharv's livery. Livery? Eloth had never heard of a smith wearing any formal garb save his guilds. Aye, he was the king's chief smith. Did you not guess that from the pattern? For a moment, the prince's kindly vagueness fell from him, and his eyes glittered as he gazed into infinite distance. It lives in my mind, though long it is since last I saw it. Long since Karen gave it secretly into the hand of Ase, our sister, she whom we called the deep-minded, to take westward and hold there for his son. Is it not the symbol of the power the smith sets in the hand of the king? Is it not the pattern of the great scepter of Morvan itself? How that meal ended, Elof never knew. He must have eaten, held converse, taken his leave in some kind of dazed trance for it was like an awakening when he found himself alone in his bedchamber, the bronzen rod cool in his clutching fingers. In the keeping of Asse it had been, but Kerberhain had cast out Asse with the other northerners, who had then founded the realm of Nordney. So what might Assenby mean where he had had his rough raising? But the settlement of Asse, a remote place where such a treasure might be hidden, and in time even forgotten, till it found such use as a gaggle of peasants might have for an instrument of kingship and command. Small wonder the Equesh chieftain had kept it from the sack of Assenby. His shamans could not have failed to know it for a thing of ancient power. A greater mystery was how Elof himself could have been so blind. Yet even as he remembered with a shudder how casually he had used it to tug and prod the huge cattle about, 
he felt the shimmer and flux within it fade and shrink to a distant gleam. He thought of it in a king's hand, and to his inner eye it burned with a warm golden flame. Startled, he let it dim once more, overwhelmed by the strangeness of his destiny. For all he knew, the sole purpose of his whole existence might be to restore this heirloom of power to hands that owned it by right. But whose hands were those? He knew one with a good claim, but now he had found another. That was too good a recipe for strife. Decisively, he wrapped the scepter in its soft leathers once again. Kermorvan was his friend. He would tell him before he told Corentin. But he would tell neither yet. The days of ease that followed held no more shocks for Elok. Indeed, they seemed to lessen the impact of all that had passed, making familiar what had felt so strange. Resolve as he might to keep apart from the court, he soon found it would not let him. In truth, as Rock and Ills delighted in pointing out, the fault was his own. In his way, he was fair of face, and his withdrawn, thoughtful manner, together with the rank and power his new garb suggested, brought him into notice among the ladies of the court, and great demand. At every turn he was greeted with a mixture of awe and breathless interest that few men could ignore, fewer still failed to enjoy, especially as young as he. Nonetheless, it made him impatient. Somewhere was Kara, and all the fair of Liz Arvelin could not, for a moment, take her place. Their attentions he enjoyed, but he found the courtly company and manners exhausting, suffocating, as rich and heavy as the garments and the hangings on the walls, and as dulled with age. Even Corentin's unfailing kindness and courtesy began to seem bland, almost sickly. Worse, Kermorvan, who greatly revered him, was taking on the same airs, and losing or curbing those flashes of spirit, even arrogance, which had seemed so much part of him. It's not so bad, protested Rock. Might be this last terrace that's taming him. And who's to blame him for that? You just got a morning head on you. Or it's stale you're getting. Stale? Laughed Elof bitterly, ducking his head beneath the chill spring waters to clear it. Worse than that. That feeling is with me still, that my past is slipping away beneath these trees. As if there's always been forest. Nothing but forest. No place, no time beyond the shadow of these boughs that weigh upon my soul. And it grows worse. Even my craft fades, all the mystery and the scholarship. Small wonder, perhaps, among this world of things that grow, the arts that dwell in metal are scant service. What can I shape or smelt here, cast or hammer? Well, find yourself something else to do. Go hunting, like guys. He's off already with that great loud Moreau. Tomorrow I'm going myself with Ills and the other lads. All save Arvis and Tenvar, who won't be budged from the court. Why not tag along? Hunting? What else have I done since I came here? Fisher, forester, hunter, gatherer till my mind rots like the leaf mold. Rock rolled on his back and kicked up water. You've turned fisher and gather before, have you not, upon the marshlands? You almost liked the life. Aye, but there I had my smithy to balance them, and a useful service to do. Here I've nothing. You've your tools and mine. You could tinker up something. What you need's a good spot of hard work. 
sweat all this holidaying out of your bones with some good, honest craft. Work? sighed Elof. What meaning has labor here? And what place for it? How could I begin it without furnace, forge, or library? Those may be found. Elof twisted round sharply in the water. It was a voice clear and unhuman as before, but of a wholly different timber. And it had not come from any of the trees around the pool, but from the rocky source of the spring itself. What is it? barked Rock. What do you hear? The spring. The falling water. What you need, you may have. Did I not say that in my realm men may live wholly as they wish? You have only to ask, and your needs shall be met. There are metals enough in these mountains, and the hall has many ancient books of lore. Some will treat of your craft. Smiths have labored in Tapiaula ere now. Build your forge where you will. May your work bring you peace of mind. I heard something, muttered Rock. A ringing, almost like a song. Water in my ears, maybe. He shook his head to clear them. No, said Elof, swim, swimming up to the base of the little fall and listening to the water hammering upon the stone. He felt suddenly alive and excited, his mind flooding with thoughts of what precious books a smith of old might have carried with him as he fled. And below them stirred the germs of a venture deep and perilous. Tapaya spoke. He suggested, as you did, that I can try my craft here. I may indeed. He has many voices, as he said. But how many eyes, I wonder, and ears? To that, the waters made no answer. Yet in the weeks that followed, he was to hear the voice of the forest again. It was a time in which he felt increasingly alone. Rock went off on his hunt, and with him Burr and Forhe and even Ills. Arvis and Tenvar seemed happy to lose themselves in courtly pleasures. Kermorvan was with Corentin, plying him with questions about Morvan and other ancient lore, or with Terrace. How serious that attachment was, Elof could not guess. But though Elof could have found company enough in the court, he shunned it. An idea had been set in his mind, a spark lit that would not go out. His craft would not leave him be. He had found his purpose. Until he achieved it, he could not rest. Cornton gladly gave him leave to search through all the castle's store of books, but at first his search seemed likely to be fruitless. It was chiefly chronicles and romances of old that had been well tended, and in some cases recopied. Fascinating as he found many of these, they were distractions he had no need of. Books on almost any skill or craft he found dirty, neglected, in some cases even crumbling to fragments as leaves to mold upon the forest floor. But he cleaned and patched what he could with fine cloth or parchment scraps pared thin and drew rich rewards. There were a few elementary books, but his capacious memory already held all they could offer. It was lost works he hoped for, texts as rare and arcane as those upon which the master smith had mounted his most deadly guard. Elof was not disappointed. From beneath a disorderly pile of histories, he recovered one full scroll of the Urcus Illin, an exhaustive treatise on symbols the Mastersmith had known of, but could never find. He had not dared hope for the Skolnir book, 
yet he found an excellent copy on fabric, with man shelves. The rarest work of all he found was the minor but fascinating daybook of Ambrus, an accomplished armor of Morvanic a century or so before Corrington's day. Smiths valued it chiefly for its brief quotations from even more obscure tracts and its illustrations. So finely drawn, they were a copyist's nightmare, for they could not be copied with blocks. It was one of these that caught his eye and set an idea dancing in his mind. But it danced with doubt and fear and a chill of revulsion at the cruelty he could not now avoid. Nevertheless, that same day he went to Corrington and sought leave to build a forge. To lessen the risk of fire, it would be made all of stone and well beyond the castle walls, in a clearing by a stream on the slopes above. As he had expected, leave was gl given gladly and more. Almayan remembered that some equipment still remained from an old smithy, and Corrington called upon the strongest among the Alfar to labor for him. Upon Elof's direction, in the weeks that followed, they willingly stripped a wide square of the clearing floor to the bedrock, while others hauled down great chunks of granite, raw and iridescent, hewn from the mountain flakes above. The walls they raised were crude, but thick and strong, fit to bear the single great slab he set across them as a roof, like some monument of old. He would have no wooden beams, he said, lest they scorch. The slatted shutters he made of slate for the same reason, hinged upon pins of iron he hammered out on a riverside rock. He hung more slate upon an iron frame to make a door, and stacked outside at the firewood the guardians brought him. His high hearth was built of dry stone, and around it were set a quenching tank of pitched slate, and stone slabs and benches to work at. Last of all, dragged up the slopes by a crowd of laughing Alfar, came what he had salvaged from the old smithy, a bellows engine, much restored and given new leathers and a great anvil of a shape strange to him. Ancient and rust-cloaked it was, yet when he smote it with his hammer, it rang true, sharp and defiant against the forest's infinite whisper. With these they brought such tools, clamps, and vices as were still usable, and also the store he had found there a very hoard of metals and gems in all stages of working, many rare and precious. They told him cheerfully that the mountains held as much more of such toys as he could desire. If he would sooner hunt dull stones than quick beasts, they would gladly take him. With that, laughing, they took their leave, not lingering for his thanks, leaping with startling strength for the pine boughs overhead. Elof looked after them and nodded to himself thoughtfully. Such a hunt among the mountains might serve many ends. He sat down then by the door that was his and gazed out over the wooded hillside. It brought back to him the mountain woods of his youth, only a few years behind him, yet an age away. In many ways, he had been happiest then, but he could never forget that only lies and corruption had lain beneath. He could no longer take happiness as a gift, without price or obligation, or trust good fortune he did not wholly understand. If Kermorvan was learning to trust his heart more, then Elof had learned to trust his less. Idyllic as Lys Arvalan seemed, he would, he must, delve out the truth that lay at its root. To that end, he had shaped his forge. He reached for Gorthar, leaning against the wall, slid it halfway from the scabbard, and studied the shadow the black blade cast. Warm and deep and dark, it seemed to flow over the ground like a viscous ink, merging with the thousand shadows of the wood. 
talisman was strong here, as should be expected. Swiftly, Elof rose and swung back the heavy door, its hinges creaking despite their grease. As he stepped over the threshold, the shadow seemed to shrink and fade, falling pale upon the scoured stone at his feet. He nodded thoughtfully to himself and played the blade carefully all around the little forge and most carefully over the water in the trough and over the least of the stone slabs, always watching the shadow intently. But nowhere did it grow the least trace darker. He sheathed Gorthar then and took it outside with him once more and sat down in the sun with a sigh. Beneath that small slab lay the only wood within the walls, the cedar lining of the chest wherein he stored his precious books against damp and smoke. Even that he had immured within pitch and stone. There would be no more, save what was already burned to charcoal. He had guessed aright. Now he must look to his materials. He reached for the heavy hide sack that held the ancient hoard, and spilled it out over the sun-warmed ground before him. It was a dazzling wealt that glittered there, but a smith's eye measured potential more profound than mere value. And what he found strange, in, or what he saw, he found strange indeed. Many pieces were so advanced it was possible to deduce the cunning design intended the subtle virtue half set upon them. Yet all such pieces had been left unfinished, even where no fault or flaw could possibly have barred their completion. So engrossed was Elof that he scarcely noticed a fish rise to a deer fly struggling on the stream. Yet in the splash and spurt of bubbles, the babbling music of the water was suddenly, subtly altered. So, Smith... Are you now content, or do you doubt still the warmth of your welcome here? Elof bowed his head courteously to the empty air. I would be ungrateful, Lord of the Forest, if I did not believe you wished me to stay and be happy. Yet when I strayed into your domain in the Westlands far away, you at first bade me and my companions be gone. Why then? Or do I give offense? The waters chuckled lightly over the pebbles in the shallows, where small birds bobbed and picked. You do not. The question is fair. I traced in you something that made me believe you other than you are. How so? Lord of the Forest? Is such sight to be fettered in the weak thoughts of men? The stream ran on in quiet a moment, dead leaves whirling on its surface. Say, then, that most men cast shadows in my mind. Shadows that vary, some lighter, some blacker. But you, you are no shadow. You are like some shifting glimmer in the forest depths. Very like indeed, for the forest is my mind. Then why fear to have me in it? asked Elof boldly. It harbors many a blacker thought than I. The tall trees stooped and bobbed, looming dark over the forge. It was for one such I took you. I did not know you for a smith among men. Aware of forces within you, I thought you an elemental, a minor power, astray in my land without leave and perhaps a danger to my folk. That I could not tolerate. You should understand. You have met some, 
the dwellers in river and lake, and the hunt. Do you tolerate them? Many of my companions they took, good men and bad alike. Why hedge your land about with such horrors, if all men are as welcome as you say? The water swirled and gurgled, and its note grew deeper. You are bold, Smith, so to bandy words with one of the powers, and not the least. If I were as ill-disposed as you suspect, would I need to answer you? I harbor such creatures out of two concerns, and the greater is pity. Pity? Even so, where else have they to dwell? Those creatures, and many others it is well you did not meet, they have needs and ways of life that would seem wholly strange to you. In the world outside, the world of men, their day is past. What parts and purposes they once had in the world's shaping, they have outlived. But they have grown used to their existence, forgetting or fearing the changes for which the time has come. That I condone, for I know how hard such changes may be. Once... This was a world of forests, Smith, before the days of men. So under my trees I afford them shelter, and they guard the borders of my realm. And guards I must have, for though I wish men well, I cannot allow them in their wasteful ignorance to devastate my land which will one day be their surest refuge. The Alfar love their children, yet will they let them play with flame? Had I no sentinels, the trees would be hewn down to feed fires or build shacks, the animals hunted to extinction, the whole ancient cycle of plenty torn asunder when it might have provided for all. For now, I must endanger a few lives that one day, when the works of men totter to their fall, I may receive them whence they should never have strayed back into the embrace of nature. Then shall I throw open my borders and welcome all. And that day may not be long removed. In it I shall need great leaders. Corentin for one. Your friend Kermorven, the Lady Ills for her folk. And, if I mistake you not, you also shall be among them. Reflect on that among your labors. That evening, as Elof strode back down the hill to the castle, he saw trails of torches winding among the trees below. He guessed it must be the hunting parties returning for the following night's feast, and hastened to greet them as they set down their catch on the greensward before the gate. Rock and Ills greeted him in boisterous good spirits. He had to endure much chafing for laziness till he managed to tell them of the forge. They in their turn had something to tell him, for they had fallen in with another party, among whom was Morhuen, the renowned bard, coming to the feast. Though he was scarce willing, till I told him of Kermorven, added Rock, and who'd blame him? That's a fine, carefree life he's been leading out there with the Alfar Elof. 
<coughs> Do you be sure and try it some day. Elof smiled. Perhaps I will. And soon. Will you go hunting metals in the mountains once again, Rock? As we did in the old days? And you, Ills? I thought you might. She laughed. Where'd you be without me? Humans lack the eye for how the stone lies. And we'll see if Alfar can beat Duergar after that game. Rock snorted. I'll be along to pick up the pieces, as usual. But for the nonce, nothing comes twixt me and my dinner, save a good bathe. Let's go in. All that evening and the next day, the court was a whirl with excited preparations for the coming feast. But Elof was beginning to suspect they looked forward to such celebrations, not only to break the monotony, but to lay down for a while burdens which had grown intolerable, their own natures. And when at last Corentin and Kermorvan led them in a solemn procession into the great court, glittering now with the strange lamps that had been hung even among the mighty oak's leaves, it was not long before his suspicions were confirmed. As the night advanced, he found the wine and music and dancing flowing together into a single inexorable current of ritual revelry. In its constant shift and change, these strange folk could truly lose themselves, subdue the pain of thought to the stiff intricacies of the dance, disperse the pain of feeling in brief flirtations, spinning from one partner to another, as heedless as the least lived mayfly by the stream. Quarantine took no active part, but he presided over the rout with amused indulgence. Only one of his folk seemed to take little joy in it all, the bard Morhuen, though many songs of his making were played. He was a gangling creature with shaggy white hair and beard, although in face and bearing he seemed scarcely older than Quarantine, by whose side he sat. He heeded that honor no more. He shifted uncomfortably in his robes and spoke few words to any save Quarantine and the guardians who waited upon him. His light blue eyes stared vaguely into remoteness, and at the many compliments paid him, his full lips worked nervously. At the height of the feast, Quarantine ceremoniously presented him to the travelers, and was only when his eye lit upon Kermorvan that the look in it became bright and alert his bow deep and reverent. For I see that all I was told of you is true, he said, and his voice rang clear and strong. You might indeed be my lord, Karen, come once again. I see in you a promise and a token that hope dies not with one day's ending, that by one winter summer is not broken that springs may follow which shall flower as fair. So may the tower arise, once to the earth cast down, and on the humbled brows there be, shall be set a crown. There was a sudden rattle of applause, as if a breath of mountain wind licked through the hall's heavy air. May it be so, barked Corentin and raised his glass in a fierce toast. Then, as if ashamed of his outburst, he smiled and sat down, and the brief tremor of excitement faded. Ah, marvelous, breathed Terrace, who was seated between Elof and Kermorvan, and shook her auburn hair delightedly. Oh, and so very long it has been since he managed a verse thus. All of a moment. Master Morhewen, Master Morhewen, won't you sing us something? With the harp, if it please you. The bard bowed. Never have I been able to refuse you aught, ah, Teresic. Even if there were not these new guests to honor. I wax old, but I will essay... He paused as he met Elof's interested gaze. 
What is this? He puzzled, aloud yet almost to himself. What is this? A terrible terror flickered in his eyes. Do all the faces of fallen Morven arise and walk abroad this night? Master Morhuin, cried Terrace, shaken. This is discourtesy. Here sits Elof the smith, to whom my lord Corrington presented you only a moment since. Elof leaned forward. I am not offended, lady. Corrington also saw some likeness in me, but to whom he could not say. Can you, master? But Morhuin glanced at him with a mixture of confusion and distrust, touched his long fingers to his forehead and mumbled a word or two. Suddenly he turned away to where Corrington and Kermorvan were in lively dispute over what he should sing. Tara seized Elof's arm and her hair tickled his ear. Now you see why Maru calls him an old fool, she whispered, stifling a giggle. But he's so sweet, truly. And the way he sang for us in the old days. Elof hardly heard. He was too acutely aware of her touch. The quiver of her breast against his arm as she chattered. The sweet scent of her like flowers warmed by the strong sun of the south. Probably she was unaware of the effect she was making. She had her cap firmly at Kermorvan. But Elof found himself fighting for resolve. Too easy, too natural to be tempted. The more so with the frustrations that nodded inside him. And the wine. To let himself be seduced, to linger... To delay a quest he had no real reason to believe could succeed. He was immensely relieved when Terrace drew free of him to join the applause as Morhuin stepped out onto the open floor before the trees. Elof, seeing him afoot for the first time, caught his breath. The bard was not merely gangling, he was grotesque his flowing robes concealing an odd shambling gait, as on limbs sorely twisted. From among the many groups of musicians in the hall, harps were thrust out to him. He made great play of picking the best and having its owner tune it to a particular fineness. Then he swept to the center of the floor, bobbed a bow to the court, and announced, By the will of our chiefest guest, Karen, Lord Kermorvan, he chuckled deferentially, and, counter to the wish of our modest prince Corentin, I will sing the deeds of Corentin Rudry of Lasten Lasterby. Kermorvan leaned across Terrace to whisper to the travelers, A ballad in the ancient mode. Lasterby was a hill town in Morven, north of the waters whose heroic last defense Corrington led, his first great deed. Morhuin tucked the harp into the crook of his long left arm and poised his long fingers carefully. Then he swept them down to a single chord that shivered off the ancient stones, merging a voice of metal as clear and bright as the harp strings, youthful and heroic. Ark, hold you silent. Heroes are sung of, such as dared strive with the stern powers of old. Men who withstood them, who waged war against them, carried them back from the heights of the north fell, held there till ice came, that no man may hinder, crackling and crushing what it could not conquer. The harp pulsed and sang under Morhuin's fingers, and though the music was strange to Elof, it struck shivering harmonies in the taut strings of his heart. Loud chords rang toxin of urgency and alarm on the stresses of the lines, while between them the strings rippled the rhythm of a cantering horse. Corentin Rudry, fiery-haired princeling, 
outrode his escort, though rough grew the hill road, fierce in his longing to leap up to Lasterby. There deal a blow to the armies of darkness, strew them like sowings of death on the fell tops, melt the bleak ice in the blood of its minions. Lasterby's walls lifted high over hilltops, gaunt garth of grey stone, ancient and grim. The harp struck a sudden false note, an ugly dissonance. The bard's voice faltered. He glanced at the strings, striving desperately to regain his fingering. But all at once the tune collapsed. The sound dissolved into a jumble. Morhewan bent forward an instant as if catching breath, then sang on with fervor, but already the spell was broken. White on its battlements, weather untimely, snow in high summer laid siege to. He faltered again, repeated, laid siege to, and then stopped altogether, shaking his head took his trembling fingers from the harp and clenched them tight. When he looked up and around at his audience, distress and shame were so naked upon his countenance that Elof could not bear to look. Cornton's face was wrung with concern. Are you well, old friend? Would you retire? No, my lord. The bard's voice was tremulous. I am sorry. I wax old, as I said. The old songs, they fade from my memory, and my fingers grow wasted and weak. I cannot force them to the fingerings of the harp any more. My lords, ladies, old friends, and new guests, sorrow is mine that I must withdraw. Never should I have come. Cornton raised a hand. Yet, if your fingers fail you, he said encouragingly, may you still not set words to dance as you did at the first? For my kinsmen here have been through a great adventure in the Westlands, he and his friends, a quest and a mighty siege. No other but you could set the tale in the song it deserves. More humans' pale eyes seemed to stare almost through him. Oh, my lord, the music has fled from me. The fire is gone out. What then remains? A verse, a line, a fragment, trifles, scraps of bark set afloat upon an endless stream. No great ballad, not even at your behest, not even yours. One song more I may make, one short but that for you. And suddenly he struck the harp he carried with the backs of his stiffened fingers, and a sudden lilting tune flowed from it. Your praise resound, prince of the halls of summer, lord of a court whose like shall not return. At your behest my songs have brought the past again, and made to live all that we loved and lost. Yet evermore that elder music fails me. The past grows dim and dark as prison walls. And stronger now, a newer music claims me. The endless woods bring healing to my soul. Now I am ever eaten up with yearning, For freedom in the wild woods I am burning. Within these walls I find no home. Free unhindered, I must roam. All praise to you, a lord of the line of Morven. All that I owe, I cannot now repay. Honor and fame have ever been your gifts to me. No minstrelly has praised a kinder lord. Yet I am not the man that long has served you. Though faithful still, I hear another call and I am drained of song to set against it, bereft of joys that held me in your hall. 
Now it is torment to me to remain here. Save for your kindness, all I find is pain here. I beg you, loose your claim on me. My friend, my master, set me free. Even as the last long phrase sang from the harp, it sagged and fell, dangled limply from his fingers. He knelt and set it down gently on the flagstones, its strings still faintly ringing. Elof was shocked to see dark stains upon them, and a heavy droplet fell, fall upon the frame. The more Hewan struggled to play true, they had cut into his very flesh. A murmur ran through the court, a soft, troubled sound, and then all was silent. When at last Corrington spoke, there was a deep tremor in his voice. For such songs as once you made, my old friend, my favor is poor recompense. You owe me nothing. If I can give you no more than leave to go, you have it, and my blessing. But may it not be long before we meet again. Morhewan made no reply, save to bow deeply ere he strode from the hall. As he reached the high door and flung it wide, he plucked the court robe from his shoulders and flung it to one of the Alfar waiting there. Elof caught his breath, and a deep unease grew in him. The bard's limbs, left bare by his simple green tunic, were not malformed. They were simply long, terribly long, and he had been standing hunched and uncomfortable to hide them. Yet this was, or had been, a man. The door swung to behind him. Silence gripped the court, in confusion or shame. Cornton stared at the bare board before him, his face pale. Around his feet, Alfar, hair and harness thick with garlands, gathered and gazed up at him with wide, worried eyes. At length, Kermorvan and the Lord Almayan, who sat by, exchanged glances. Almayan gestured to the musicians. A floor sounded, and they struck up a slow, stately music. Couples, Kermorvan and Terrace among them, rose and glided out into the formal patterns of a dance, sweeping this way and that across the floor in shifting lines as ceaseless and repetitive as waves upon the shore. Cornton glanced up, but seemed to find little power in it to soothe him. No more did Elof. To him it was a slow torment. But barely had it drifted to its end before an older Alfar, a mane of white hair hanging to his shoulders, gestured to the musicians quite as airily as Almayan. A drum beat out a slow rhythm. Bowed strings sang a livelier tune. Deeper plucked strings sounding a stamping, loping beat. A shout arose, and the Alfar bounded out into the court. Cornton looked up, startled, then smiled indulgently. Grinning widely, they began to circle the hall, slowly at first, then faster in a loping, bouncing run, arms held high above their heads, licking their wrists sideways and snapping their fingers in time to the beat. Others, men and women, sprang out to join them, whirling and tossing on their long limbs like storm-sprung saplings. In a great train they wove and gambled about the tree, wheeling and careening with such abandon that their braided hair flew wild and flung out flowers and garlands which fell among the watchers. The sudden outburst of vitality brought laughter to Elof's lips, and a spirit of mischief. It reminded him of festivities in his own village, clumsy but cheerful in which he had often longed to take part. Now there's a dance, he cried. With a swift bow to Corrington, he sprang out among the dancers and seized a pretty Alfar girl as she went whirling by. 
He barely glimpsed Ills and Rock hopping out after him before strong arms spun him away into the dance. Tenvar bounded by him with a girl on each arm, his feet scarcely touching the ground. And as Elof came round the tree once more, he was startled to see some of the castle folk hovering tentatively on the edge of the throng. He had thought they might be offended, but they seemed more intrigued than scornful at this sudden eruption. At last, Svethen the Mariner actually seized a partner and plunged in with gusto. Others moved hesitantly after him. Elof all but stumbled as Terrace tripped lightly by him, long gown kilted into its golden girdle, pulling Kermorvan after her, laughing wildly. Behind them, Almayan bounced along with a tall lady of the court, dignity flung like flowers to the wind. The whole court of immortals seemed to be reveling in its lost decorum. The dance whirled endlessly on, the musicians whisking from tune to tune, circles forming, breaking, reforming, till many had to fall back to draw breath. Elof was among them. For all his strength, he was at a disadvantage among these longer legs. His partner brushed a kiss on his cheek and bounced back into the throng. He was content to slump down beneath the great tree and let his roaring pulse settle, his dizzy head clear. Round and round they swept, wood folk and castle folk and his friends. And as he watched them hurtle by, a strange thing happened. Half-formed thoughts he had held back took shape in his mind, became a vision. It was as if the dancers sped faster, ever faster, till they merged into a bright, painful blur with a single static figure at its heart, frozen at the crest of a leap. Before his eyes it changed, burgeoned like a tree, the outflung limbs grew longer, the trunk stretched and curved upward like a supple birch. The very feet and fingers stretched out like eagerly grasping roots and tendrils. Then the vision was gone, the dance clear before his eyes. But Elof felt a sickening chill swell up in him, a growing, uncontrollable shiver. He was looking at his vision made flesh. Not in one body, but in all that flashed by him, in a chain, a sequence, a progression from Kermorvan to Corentin, from him to long-limbed Maru Ladin, from him to Morhuen, and from his drawn-out, unmanageable limbs to the graceful climbing bodies of the Alfar. And what of their minds? At best from nobility and wisdom to kind, kindly simplicity? at worst from man to beast. Was that the true dance in the halls of summer? He cursed under his breath. It still made no sense. Not as long as the Alfar had children and new old age. How could they then be linked to the castle folk, who knew neither? He slapped a hand furiously against the rough bark. Abruptly, the walls seemed to vanish around him. The wind-blown trees come rushing in on him. Deep in a distant pool, intent on a treasure of glittering scales, an otter plunged. High over the borderless carpet of treetops, an eagle screamed and dived, clawing. The wood folk are their children. Elof swallowed, shook his head scarcely able to speak. This was not the fluting of birds. It was the first voice he had heard, far off in the west. Only here it was no longer remote and dim. It was all around him, and it blew through his mind like a gusty wind. He should not have leaned against the tree. Too much of his secret thought might already be betrayed but it seemed that only his immediate thought was read. You have clear sight, one alone. The Alfar are their children, or children of their kin. 
and they love and revere their, their elders, and delight in their service. But can that sight not also show you the reason for the change? For I do not hide it. Here, life unending is offered to all. Here, they may live as they think best. Only offspring must be denied them, for children are a mirror of mortality. Nonetheless, many come to find that gift a burden. Often those who grasped it most eagerly at the first endure it least easily in the end. Heroes alone may bear immortality for long, to wrest its glories from its pain. Elof clutched at his chest, where it seemed that a sudden stab of pain pierced him. So that is why so many of the great names of old are gathered here. Lesser men have long since fallen by the wayside. Deep in the mold beneath a rotting tree, a night-sown spore took root and swelled. No, not fallen. The longer men live, the less willingly will they embrace the idea of their death. Do not many, even in hideous torment, cling to that fragile cord of life? And yet they could not return to their old lives in the world outside, when all they knew there has long slipped away. So it is that I smooth their path before them. The wearier they grow of their lives, the less they are aware of time, the more they pleasure they find in the passing moments in the simpler things, growing more like children, like animals, as you guessed. They hunt with the Alfar, live with them, like them. As time, which dictates growth and change, fixes its claims upon them once more, they become more like the Alfar in shape. The past slips from them, and they move into step once more with the great dance of nature. In the end, they go off with the Alfar and never return. They mate with them and bear children who are wholly Alfar and forget all that once they were. The mantle of mortality settles about them once again, they lead free and happy lives, knowing no difference, and in the end they die in peace and rejoin the river. But, began Elof sharply, then stopped short. He could only say too much. You need not fear such an ending for yourself or your friends. You least of all, while you burn thus from within. But even if it were otherwise, what then? Is it not worth the venture to live longer at least than the scant span of men, with not to fear at its end but forgetfulness and peace? To have time to hone and perfect your craft, to fulfill it with all the resource of my realm at your disposal? Alone among the ancient powers, I truly care for men. I know what is best for them. Through the forest floor, muffled among the rotten leaves, came the light sound of a footfall. A snake tensed its coppery flanks its flicking tongue tasting the air for the scent of warm blood. Elof bowed. Not for nothing are you named the Preserver, Lord. I will take heed of your bounty and venture to stretch it further. 
I will go hunt metals in your mountains, with such of my friends as will come. You have only to ask the Alfar. They will guide you and serve you. May you find what you seek. Elof bowed. Thank you, Lord. I believe I will. But it was not until the third day of their hunt, high on the rocky slopes, that he did so. For though he found many rare substances he might have need of, it was a richer prize he truly sought, the minds of his companions. It was for that reason I brought you here, he told them. Kermorvan nodded. Here, where the Alfar cannot hear us, where no birds perch, where nothing grows, away from the eyes and ears of the forest. I guessed that much. Well, what more? Elof looked unobtrusively over the edge of the narrow rock shelf upon which such of the company as he could gather were huddled. Far below, the Alfar were preparing a camp among a clump of bristlecone pines. One of them glanced up anxiously, but Elof waved back with a disarming good cheer he hardly felt. He had expected Kermorvan to be horrified at hearing of Tapiao's words, yet he was as calm as ever. What more? Is that not enough? Why, pray? demanded Tenvar. To live forever? That's a wonder. And yet still be able to escape from it and live in peace? What's so terrible about that? Hey, <laughs> laughed Boer. Like owning land on both banks of the river. Kermorvan nodded, though he looked a little unhappy. I will allow it seems strange. I would prefer to end, if end I must, as my own man, with my own mind. But perhaps this is obtuse, and I would not expect all men to feel likewise. But for others... Borhi, how would you choose? And you, Rock? To live whispered Borhe softly without hesitation. Never face dying no more. Rock hesitated. It's a mighty temptation, he muttered. I can see it might be a burden. It's a gamble. But then so's every breath you draw. Well then, said Kermorvan, you hear the voice of the citizen. He shrugged. I see no great harm in it. Do you not? blazed Elof, so loud he feared the Alfar below might hear. More quietly he added, Then look at it as it has taken effect. That architect, Ills, that bard, Kermorvan. What became of them? A hall half built, songs half sung? Is that not so? Ills looked at him uneasily, making no reply, but Kermorvan only shrugged. There mu must be many who could not stay the course, even men worthy and gifted. What of that? Is it not better to fall in a venture than never to have tried? The more so when the fall is so merciful, the venture so worthwhile. Has it not saved for this day such as Fethen, as Corentin? Saved? echoed Elof. And for this day? I wonder. What might they have achieved in the world outside, these folk, if they had not been prevented from reaching the West? King Karen's son, your ancestor, would not have lacked support. Corentin and Asse would have established his throne, as Karen intended. They would have prevented the bitter sundering of north and south that has so weakened our folk. Instead, what have they done? They have survived, and that is all. Aye, they live, but as what? Shadows in a court of shadows, 
remote, ineffectual, powerless to help or harm. Quarantine is noble, aye, and kind. He could not be otherwise and still himself. But what else have all these centuries riven from him? Where is the fiery prince he once was, the strong warrior against the evils of the ice? And Svethin, far from his seas, what meaning has he any more? And the Lady Terrace, is she any more than once she was? Kermorvan's eye grew bleak and cold, but he held it. And what have you? How have you fared since you came here? What plans have you laid to summon your folk hither, those who depend on you, little though they may know it? When will word be sent back to Kerberhain? Kermorvan frowned. I cannot act in haste. Do you imagine Corentin and I have not taken counsel over this, long and deep? This place must first be made ready to receive great numbers. Folk must be summoned little by little, as Tapiao decrees, and their doubts resolved. We will need more than a few days to plan such matters, will we not? A few days? asked Elof quietly, though chill fingers traced out his spine. How long do you imagine we have been here? Rock and the others have been away hunting. I have had a whole forge built for me. It did not take shape overnight. He saw the bewilderment in their faces, in Kermorvan's most of all, and he thought back to the night of their coming. I wonder how long it has seemed to Corentin. Ah, that's as Tapiao told you, Rock objected. No wonder his sense of time's a bit blurred after all these centuries. No, muttered Ills uneasily, when already it seems to be happening to us. Elof, how long were we gone? It seemed a night or two only. Three weeks, perhaps. Maybe even four. How should I know if you do not? The forge was three in the building. The travelers stared uneasily at each other, but Kermorvan shaded his eyes. Perhaps our sense of time fades as our bodies cease to age, said Ills quietly. Tapiel may not be aware of that, for it seems he takes no form human or otherwise. But it makes it hard to trust him now. How am I to know? Kermorvan burst out suddenly. When you told me of Tapiao's words, I believed we had found what we sought, that out of the horrors of the journey I had stumbled on something greater than I had ever dared hope. The past I dreamed of restoring come again. Henceforth, let none of us be deceived by phantoms of his vanquished past, quoted Elof, darkly. Whose words were those? Kermorvan hammered fist against palm. But how am I to tell? How can I delve for truth in this morass? What profit would Tapayao find in so ensnaring us, when he could sweep us from the earth with a gesture? or have his creatures tear us to shreds. It makes no sense, Elof. I must have proof. And even if he is our enemy, how shall we fight him or escape him? How shall we raise hand or will against a living power? Elof hesitated, but in the end, as all the others were silent, he dared to speak. That will be hard indeed. But it may be that I can help you, now that I have my forge. He did not look up, but he felt their eyes upon him. You would wield smithcraft against the powers? demanded Burr, in doubt and wonder. A man must use what he has. I would turn my craft against the steers of the stars if they threatened those things I care for. 
The fervor in his own words startled him. Speaking without thought, he had bared feelings he hardly knew he had. He was aware as never before of the craft within him, a roaring furnace flame hungry to be used. He bent his mind upon it, and it narrowed to a needle of devouring incandescence, precise, measured, irresistible. But I had no thought of open battle. Guile is used against us, and is best repaid in the same coin. He turned then to Carmorvan, who had not answered him. Well, it seems to me that we came upon this place at an evil time for you, when you had begun to doubt your own leadership, your own wisdom in making this journey. Perhaps the forest had already begun to work on you, as it had on me. But I am not of that mind. You are our leader yet. You ask for proof? I will try to find it, though the attempt may be perilous. So perilous that if you choose, if you deem we may trust the forest so completely, I will pursue it no further. Say now, what, which shall it be? Kermorvan stood up on the rock and gazed out over the forest in silence. But it was only a moment before he spoke his voice crisp and calm. You may try what you will. They came down from the mountains laden under many a sack of oars and other stones, which they gladly left at Elof's forge on their way to the castle. But Ills lingered a moment, and Rock at once began to busy himself about the forge, as he had so many times in the past. Elof looked at him, you needn't have no part in this, if you do not wish to. Nor you, Ills. Ills chuckled and leaned against the workbench. Rock screwed up his florid features into a ferocious scowl. Yours are not the only hands can wield a hammer. Could be ours, Groba, trifle itchy again at that. And you'll be needing a brace of good forge hands if only to pin down the top of your skull now and again, eh, <laughs> lady? Elof looked at them both, and he smiled. A great weariness seemed to lift from him, a cloud from his spirits. He hooked an arm round Ilza's broad shoulders and rumpled Rock's thick hair down into his eyes. Ass! I'm blessed in the pair of you but I doubt any such task will need many hands. Slow and subtle it will have to be. Aye, and secret, said Rock quietly. You were wondering yourself about the forest's eyes and ears. We might distract it somehow. And share the peril, yes. I know your mind too well now, my lad. But that may not be necessary. And he took up Gorthar, which he was careful to leave outside, and showed them the dwindling of its shadow. Tapayao said it would avail me little among the cold stonework of men, and indeed upon Kerberhine's walls it faded. There he betrayed a limit to the forest's power. I guessed that was why lies Arvalin was completely in wood, not stone. In stone his thoughts cannot dwell, and I guessed also that both he and the castle folk would be wary of fire. So for reasons innocent in themselves, I shaped a place within his power, within which his power could not extend, a dark spot in his mind. He looked around the barren little hut with a feeling of grim satisfaction. Within the forest I built my forge, but within my forge the forest cannot come. Rock blew out an astonished breath. Ooh, so you've dared turn your craft against a power already. And succeeded, said Ills quietly her eyes shining. 
only at the first step, cautioned Elof. I do not think he has guessed yet, for I have spent little time in here. When I begin my labors, he will find out, sooner or later. He will not do anything at first, I guess. He seems more concerned to win me over, for now. But he will not hold his hand forever. I will have only one try at my work, and I do not yet know what that will be. Rox stared. No idea at all? I did not say that. I know what I need. I know how hard it will be to achieve, subtler even than the mind sword, for it will brook no compulsion, but seek rather to loosen chains. Hills drew breath. I begin to see, but the craft that would take time, and the time. You could use pattern welding again, or alloying, but the one might be too coarse, the other too fine. You must needs try over and over till you hit upon the balance. Eloth, little short of mastership will suffice. I know, he said, striving to steady the tremor of desperation. But how will I find it here? But I have to try. Try indeed said Rock, chewing idly at a grass stem. It's often enough you've surprised yourself in the past, let alone me. When you need us, here we are. For now, well, there's your fire lit, bread and meat by your books, your tools laid to hand, and us on our way down to the castle, I think. Hills nodded a little sadly. Towards nightfall, we'll be back, if only to see that you sleep. I know you, Elof. Elof smiled as he watched them trudge away through the trees. Somehow he felt strangely free once more, here in this crude cavern of a forge. He did not understand why until evening, when he looked up from his reading as shadows fell and birds trilled their twilight songs. In his mind's eye, reeds hissed in the breeze, and mists rolled silently over them. It was very like his strange old marshland smithy here, that place where he had sought and found healing, and with it himself. He smiled. The memory was newly clear in his mind once more. He laid down his book, Rock and Ills would have no need to come and fetch him, that night or any other. Haste and worry might lead him to miss something vital. So it was that every evening around nightfall he would walk down alone through the darkening woods, following the path of the stream. And it is told that often in those times he spoke again with Tapayao. It made him nervous at first, that voice that was so many voices, the more so as it seemed well aware of his misgivings. But still, it sought to win him over, and he spoke and questioned freely as before, and was told of many wonders. As the late summer drew on towards autumn, he heard the voice among the rush and whistle of the wind in the pines, the solemn thunder of a cataract, and once, fearfully, in the devouring roar of a distant earth slide among the pines. It was then, angry at his fright, that he grew bold enough to ask Tapayao why he took no single form to speak, if the lesser powers that haunted his woods could do as much. The deep pools of the stream bubbled up the answer. It is because they are lesser that they may do so with ease. Would you confine this stream within your trough, this pool within your cup? You would catch only as much as your vessel might hold. So it is with powers of high order. 
Yet, I heard that some may do so on occasion. The one they call the Raven. Indeed. Such as we may take human shape, or any other we care to. But in so doing, we become only a facet of ourselves. The greater we are, the less easy we find it. Forming a body becomes a difficult concern, and its result less like us. More than a man he may be, or she, for gender goes beyond the body, but less, far less than the power itself. And flesh hangs on us like fetters, there is so much of ourselves, our wisdom and knowledge, that we cannot draw on till we revert to our true shape. Worse, we fall victim to all the strange demands of flesh, and often cope less well than those born into it. Many become too like human beings, and may turn strange and willful, pursuing their purposes in odd manner, or even delighting in pleasures perverse or evil along the way. I would not so lose my dignity." Nor would I become so vulnerable. To be injured or destroyed in body is pain and weakening to us, and a lasting drain on our strength, even permanent in some cases. Few will gladly risk it, and that is as well for your petty races and nations. For the ills the powers of the ice now cause are as nothing to what they would do if they could walk freely among men. Vast is their power, singly or together, yet vastly is it bound up in the sheer effort of sustaining the ice, their most potent weapon. So it is that they tend to shun any true form, remaining imminent around the ice and their domains nearby. Such is Tawin, whose realm borders upon my own, my mocker, my shadow, my great enemy, lord of the withered marches. At most, when they wish to meet mortal eyes, they may take on some half-substantial mask of power and terror. I believe I have seen such, benighted once upon the ice. I hear it by the shiver in your voice. But being bound thus may force human shape upon them. Where the ice will not serve them, they must seek out new weapons, new agents apt to their thought. Elof remembered his late master and nodded. Then it was as if the ice clenched a chill fist beneath his stomach, for he guessed at Tapayao's next words ere they were spoken. Not now, only the greatest of those cold minds are strong enough to do this, to don the shape they abhor. Once, an age past, Town was their leader. Sustained by his weaker brethren, he roamed the world and sought to twist weak mind to his fell purpose. But I am the friend of man, and had the service of many. I wrestled with him, 
and threw him down and drove him back, stripped of his body and sunken to a shadow of the power that once he owned. In these days another rules, a clutching, binding spinner of intrigue, who oft-time walks the world in a fair form to sway the hearts of men. Veiled so in flesh, she shows but a small portion of her own great beauty and majesty and terror. Yet I have heard that to men it seems great indeed. What is her name? choked Elof. Teun and Tar she is styled. Teun's deadly consort. But the creature she becomes among men names herself Lohi. Elof remembered little of his walk back that night. He ate little and slept less, tossing and turning upon the furs of his bed. Could Tapayao have heard of his own quest and seek to turn him aside from it? Perhaps. But while the master of trees might slant a truth, he would not lie so plainly. Lohi also has taken an apprentice. If she's Lohi's, she'll be nothing for you and I. For what that girl has, Lohi has. Be sure of that. No smith welded my chains, and even if you were the greatest among men, you could not make them. The words of many voices blurred and burned in his mind and became one, echoing away into distances vast and chill. Nothing. You could not. If Lohi was as Tapayao said, then what was Kara? What had he dared to love? What had he set out to seek across all the breadth of this vast land? Across all the world, if need be. But then, as if in answer, he heard the dark timbre of his own words, remembered her heart leap beneath his hand as she spoke. I am of no common sort. I will not change. He lay still then, and a bitter calm settled across his thoughts. She would not change? Then no more must he. What he loved, he loved. It was as simple as that. He could only go on as he had done, seek with as single a mind as he had sought to counter the mind sword, as he had sought to reforge Gorthar. It came to him then. From his long search through the remnants of the Master Smith's library, a memory surged up. A matter that had seemed of little moment at the time. So might it still, in itself. But if he could turn it about, it would surely serve his will. He slept then, but excitement woke, awoke him at first light. He rose and waited agog for rock or ills to stir. What do I know of that? She growled sleepily. Of copper or of iron in corrosives? Many things, though I am not my folk's best scholar in such matters. Chiefly that they corrode. How much? How fast? What they form? What they create, hissed Elop excitedly. That's what I mean. No? But we'll see. Now, we'll need quantities of corrosives. Sheet copper and iron as pure as we can make them. And some of that powdery black stone the Mastersmith used for marking parchment. Ought to be plenty in the hills, yawned Rock. Comes from schist or the like, doesn't it? Won't lead do as well? No. 
It's not for making marks that way. <coughs> Come, bestir yourself. We dare not waste the day. We've long weeks of work ahead. <coughs> he spoke truly, save that the weeks extended into months. They toiled far into that night, and many that followed, preparing the forge for the long work to come. Then they vanished for weeks on end with the guardians, hunting out rare or precious minerals from the stones and the finest clays that could be gathered. Eloth made it his business to sweep rock and ills along by sheer will, till he could almost see the lethargy of castle life fall from them. As the long summer faded and the heavy rains of autumn passed, he spent every hour of daylight in the forge, and by night its fires flared and shimmered among the gaunt evergreens, a defiant assertion of warmth and energy. Many asked of him what he labored on with such exertion, but all he would say was that it was to be a gift. And there came a night when the little forge shone like a beacon through the trees, so high did its fires burn. Every gap and cranny and shutters and door blazed with light, as if the stone beneath had melted and let the earth fires through. Later the shutters were opened to let a cloud of steam disperse, and rock and ills stumbled wearily away down the well-worn trail to the hall. Elof lingered long thereafter, and the hammering and crackling of clay molds echoed through the night. At last, he made his way down to the castle in the small hours of a morning that sparkled with frost. So silent was the forest that he was quite unprepared for the sudden change in the music of the stream. Well, Smith, upon what do you labor such long hours? Elof smiled tautly. A uh, casting in silver, lord of the forest. A jewel, a gift for a great lord. I do not doubt it will be worthy of him. Yet, have a care. Abroad in these woods so late without the guardians. You are aware I have other subjects. For many, the night is their province. Upon the path to the castle you will be safe, but never stray from it. There was a sudden rustle, and Elof ducked sharply as a wide shadow swooped down upon him. But it passed and settled with a flutter upon a branch ahead. A huge owl that stared at him with glittering eyes topped by feathery peaks like horns. A stare cold and unnerving. Elof caught his breath and swallowed. Hard. He nodded. I hear you, Lord Tapao. I will keep to the path. Good night. But his smile was grim as he made his way through the last of the trees. Grim as the satisfaction he felt. He would keep to the path indeed, the one he had trodden since the beginning. Tapayo had at last dropped the mask a little, but though that was interesting for many reasons, it meant he must be swift now, swift as the work allowed, and as ruthless. He clutched his cloak around him, the frost seemed to settle on his heart. Somewhere within him that seam of iron still lay, that callous streak which had let him forge the mind sword at another's great cost. He hated it, yet now he must summon it up and turn it to the greater good. That also would be an achievement of mastery. The next morning all stood ready. He could not hold back. The sheet copper had been rolled into cylinders, 
rods of iron set within, and the whole set in small jars of sand-fused glass, into which Ills added a strong solution of corrosives. From these, pitch-coated threads of twisted copper led into a stone bath full of a foul-smelling solution. A huge spearhead shape hung within, of the purest gold they could attain. On a bench sat a crucible of the gray mineral, powdered fine and mixed with egg white and other substances. And besides it, a light and intricate framework of silver, polished to a mirror shine. Rock and Ills watched in astonishment as Elof took it up and referring to the litter of scrolls and slates upon the next table, dipped a fine brush in the mineral powder and began to trace minute rows of intricate characters upon it. Then, donning a glove, he touched the remaining copper threads to it. Rock exclaimed as a shower of tiny blue sparks arose. But Ilza's face brightened with sudden understanding and she nodded sagely as Elof fastened the threads tight to the frame and with long tongs lowered it carefully into the bath. He watched a moment, motioning them to silence, until he saw a faint bubble rise and burst upon the greasy surface. Then he began to sing softly, under his breath at first, but rising now and again into words they could make out. Awaken! Awake, from night-bound depths what long lay hid, let it arise to blind the day. From tomb a voice, from time an hour, from pattern form, from weakness power. To darkness light, in embers flame, from dust a tree, silence a name. The stillness stirs, ill's loss regains. What was returns, what is remains. At length he smiled at them and sat back. It begins, he said. And what exactly might it be? inquired Rock sardonically. Elof's eyes glowed darkly. A thing our late master never dreamed of. A coating of gold finer than the thinnest foil or leaf, a blending of metals finer than pattern welding, more precise than alloying. I read of it as a method of extracting difficult ores, but saw how it could be made to act for me. In these threads flows a force that bites as fiercely as the corrosive spawning it. Do not touch them barehanded. It seeks to pass through anything, but water, and most metals especially. And in flowing through that bath, from point to frame, it will carry with it minute particles of the gold. Little by little they are settling on the frame, more thickly upon the characters I traced. And other layers will follow, gold, silver, copper, chrome, and other rarer metals and upon each I can set its particular virtue. He laughed, on every particle almost, if I so desired. Ills tapped her large teeth and nodded. I should have remembered. The like method for oars is indeed known among us, and no doubt for work like this, if needed. But the virtues you set upon it, well... They baffle me. Elof stood abruptly and peered down into the tank. Only a part of it, he muttered. A small part. Meanwhile, there is more to be done. Rock, that wide mold flask I made, and the fine clay. I have the wax armature ready here. We are not finished our casting yet. Ill stared at the delicate waxen shape he lifted from a high shelf. But what living use could that be? Elof grinned wolfishly. A strength against my fears that my will has found. When it is complete, and wields its power, then you will understand. 
In the weeks that followed, the castle saw little of him. Ever more often he slept on the hard hearthside, seldom returning even for food. Yet when ills a rock brought at him, the only ones he would suffer, they most often found him huddled motionless over one of the bubbling stone baths, as if he could watch or will the invisible flow of matter within its depths. Only his lips moved, and the words he spoke came not to their ears. More than once ills bade him sharply have a care, for many of the liquids were fell poisons, unsafe even to breathe. Certainly in this time he grew pale and ill to look at, his brow furrowed, his eyes and cheeks sunken. But all he would do was shrug, turn perhaps to his books a while, and demand to be left alone. So the days passed, and ever more chill blew the forest winds, till the frost lingered long into the morning. It was in the early hours of such a day that Elof watched the last coating, which was of silver, take shape upon his work. And though it was no more than a dull gleam deep in the brown liquid, he knew when it should be ready. He took the longest tongs he had, and lowered them delicately, very delicately, beneath its surface, for the bath of silver held the most deadly poison of all. Then, taking a firm grip, he stood a moment, and for the first time since the beginning, he chanted aloud, yearning, defiant. Dark is the moment, great our need, fierce is the fire that bids me heed. Burning bright in my breast, drive me from life, from death. Unbinder, unchainer, burn with that flame. Renewer, restorer, be that your name. Break you the bonds that hinder my quest. Arise from the shaping to me. Then, with a single smooth effort, he drew the metal forth, upward, straight up till the metal threads drew taut and snapped amid a rain of sparks, boiling the poison beads to vapor as they showered back into the tank. Though the work had grown heavier, he held it for long, long minutes, unmoving above the tank, until no more of the venom fell. Then he washed it carefully many times in water distilled and set aside for that purpose. Only then did he dare take it in his gloved hands and scrub it gently clean in the trough, running his eyes across the perfect surface, the smooth, even coating over the steel that showed no trace of the myriad layers of many metals, the thousands of characters traced out beneath. He could have lingered over it, rejoicing in its beauty and smoothness, in the completion of long months of labor, but the flames blazed yet within him. He allowed himself one curt nod before he turned to his bench and the fine work of finishing. Thus, it was only that same afternoon that a message arrived at the court, to the effect that Elof would be honored if he could show Prince Corentin, and with him, Lord Kermorvan, his forge, and the first fruits of his labor. Ills, who delivered the message, came puffing back up the hill to the forge, with rock on her heels. They're coming, she gasped. Any moment, with rock. Elof nodded. How did they take it? he asked. <laughs> they seemed amused. Kermorvan wondered why you couldn't just come down. But Corrington said it was a courtesy he owed you. He likes you, I think, Elof. Elof nodded again somberly. I know. Terrace wanted to come, but I said it would be too crowded, just as you ordered, Elof. Now would you mind giving me some warning what harebrained scheme it is you're planning? Elof rose and shook his head dismissively. Better you have no part in it, should it fail, you and Rock. And... Perhaps should it succeed as well. Silence now. 
They come. Kermorvan's voice rang out across the clearing, and a moment later his tall outline, swollen by the fur cloak he wore, blotted the cold light from the doorway. Elof stepped out to greet his visitors, and Kermorvan stared. Harris Gate, you've changed these last few days. Since I saw you last? Weeks, rather, even months. And so have you. For he thought Kermorvan's face was fuller. The look in his eye is no longer intense, but relaxed, amused, like a watcher at some entertainment, a specter at the margins of life. But enough of that for now. My Lord Carrington, you do me great honor. Thornton smiled. Not so. You honor me, and if truth be told, I welcome the distraction. Winter is a dull time. I am leaving on a hunt tomorrow. Kermorvan promises me you can work miracles. You must be the judge of that, Lord. Enter and excuse the discomfort. Thornton ducked through the doorway as Elof had never needed to and stood looking around him at the disorder of equipment on every side. This is a strange place, he said softly. Forces are at work here. I could sense them if I were blindfolded. You are a smith of power and craft, Elof. Elof bit his lip. Then accept this, Lord, as some earnest of your words. He reached beneath the bench and lifted an object wrapped in bark cloth. For you are a great prince, and it is fitting that this, my first work here, should be yours. The bark cloth fell away, and the others gasped. Thornton himself went momentarily very pale as the gleaming thing was lifted to his eyes. But it was Kermorvan who spoke first, astonished. That is an image of the coronet of Morvanek, he barked. How did you know of such a thing, Elof? I found it, drawn in one of the texts here. Corrington laughed, shaking his head in wonder. But why then have you set this fair thing on so rich a war helm, Smith? For I am nothing if not a man of peace now. Thus it was shown in the text, Lord. And it seemed to me right that you should have your crown so, who fought so vali valiantly in your youth for the right. But will you not don it, if only for the measure? Corrington seemed genuinely much moved. He bowed deeply to Elof, and raised the work of bright silver, tall, plated helm and many-peaked crown, high above his head. The sun was falling westward, an angry bronze globe in the gray waste of sky, its long rays streaming in through the open doorway. They got helm and crown, mirror bright, and set upon its patterned plates a glow of fire, tipped its peaks scarlet as they did the mountain snows awoke white fire and rainbows from the cluster of pale gems at its brow. The light seemed to shine through Corrington's fingers as slowly and with grave dignity he lowered the crown onto his head. There for an instant it rested, framing his face, noble and serene as some ancient statue. Then the eyes flew wide. A spasm crossed the features, and they twisted in anguish. Corrington screamed aloud, once, hoarsely. His fingers knitted with fearful tension, tearing at each other, at his garments. His tall frame convulsed and crumpled, and the Prince of Morvanek collapsed amid his streaming robes onto the stony floor of the smithy. Rock and Ills cried out and ran to him, but Elof spread his arms and thrust them back by main force. 
Dr. Morvan rounded on him. You, this is your doing. To him who has shown you so much kindness. What have you done to him? The cruelest thing I could possibly have done, said Elof, and in his voice was utter blackness. I have restored him to himself. What? Enough of your folly, growled the warrior, and plunged forward to the prince. But now it was Ills who jerked him back, thrusting him down on a bench, and so startled was he that he suffered in a moment. Elof looked down at him, his face bloodless. With the virtue set within that crown, that helm, I have broken the holds of the forest, the fetters Papayao has set upon him. Kermorvan stared up at him, lips moving before he could speak clear. You, you measure yourself against one of the powers? You claim? In a small space, for a short span of time, his mind and memory are laid clear now, set free with no sweet songs to cloud them. Free to remember, growled Rock hoarsely, kneeling slowly by the prince's side. He could not continue. Free to remember a thousand years, whispered Ills, and tears trickled down her plump cheeks. To remember... All at once. Poor man. Poor lost man. Abruptly, Kermorvan barged past Elof and knelt by Corentin. Elof saw him raise a hand to draw off the helm and nerved himself to intervene. But it was another hand that clutched Kermorvan's wrist and thrust it sharply away. Quarantine's eyes were open wide, gray and desolate as a winter sky they mirrored. My dear lord, whispered Kermorvan, Prince Quarantine. The tall man shook his head slowly. Prince, no longer, he muttered, and his voice was a whisper, dry and unsteady. Quarantine is no more. Quarantin is dead. His shadow am I, nothing more. His mask, empty, eyeless, hollow within. So are we all, all this court, a play of shadows dancing on the wall. The dancers long since fled. Shadows of life, of love, of honor, all lost, all sped. His work, his doing, Cursed be he. You see, Elof, hissed Kermorvan, you torment him. And to what? No, croaked Corentin, clutching again at Kermorvan's arm. Not him, not him. For this pain I would buy with my own heart's blood if need be. It is Tapayao I curse, the forest and its poisoned gift of years. So many years, so many, of seeing, understanding, yet being blind. Seeing what? Elof's voice grew strange in his own ears, harsh and imperious, tinged with night. What have you understood? Cornton stared up at him wide-eyed. I know that voice. I know it of old. Tapayao's will, that I have understood. His design for men. His grand design. The long fingers clawed in the dust. Kermorvan looked at him doubtfully. We know something of that. To, you, to be immortals. Or Alfar, as suits men best. Are there not worse choices than that? Are there? There was no kindness now in Quarantine's laughter. It was cold and bleak. 
Do you not see that there is no choice at all, save whether to linger or fall swiftly, to preserve the aspect of a man a while, or surrender it all at once? A year, a thousand years, what does it matter? The burden of the years is too great for any man. The force knows that well. In time, the change must come to all. Slowly, subtly, insidious as poison. He looked down at his long fingers. His fists clenched in sudden spasm. And blood started between the taut fingers. Do I not see it at work? Even now, within me? Look at me. Look at any of us. Are we not, all of us, on the road to the Alfar form? And that is Tapayao's will. But he's not one of the evil powers, is he? Sputtered Rock. The uh, ones of the ice? I mean, if the forest's not on the side of life, who is? Of life, yes, said Corrington bleakly. But of men? Are we, as we are, on the side of life untrammeled, unbounded, of any life save our own? One thing of worth these long years beneath the trees have taught me, and that is that all nature is one. When we waste it, we spill our own blood. We tear bread from our own lips. That lesson... It is the lot of all men to learn in time, perhaps. But Tapaya would not have us learn. He sees in us the wasting of his domain, the taming of his power. He fears us, as the first powers feared the coming of life into this lifeless perfection of their world. Yet he dare not rebel as they have. For what would become of the forest then? He seeks instead to force men into the mold he thinks best. To strip us of what sets us most in conflict with all else that lives. Our minds, said Elof heavily, as I feared. He told me that unending life was only for the heroes among men. I see now that no man cheats the river without a price. Such life is for nobody. In the world outside, with all its chances and perils, it could not be. Only here, in this womb of the forest, can the bodies of ordinary men endure thus. And that robs endurance of all meaning. For what value had your life here? A purpose. To tread the same paths over again, to dance the same dances, say the same words, act the same pale acts of love sunk into ritual, and all the time his hand lay on your minds, told you this was perfection, the best you could hope to find. Perhaps he truly believes it is, so little does he comprehend men. Small wonder you have all grown weary in time, however hard you fought to remain yourselves. And as you grow weary, your minds cloud, your bodies change until you are driven to lay aside your humanity as a relief from lingering pain. Small wonder. Silence fell. Corrington drew himself painfully to his knees, gazing at Elof in growing puzzlement. But suddenly his eyes shifted, staring past the smith, out of the doorway into the mass of trees beyond. Elof moved to bar it, lest he should try to flee. But then he also saw what had caught Corrington's eye. See? croaked the prince. See? Snow falls. The first snow. Snow on the forest. Kermorvan blinked like a man awakening from deep sleep. Aye, my lord. A few flakes only. And it cannot lie long, for spring is not far off. What of it? Let me. What of it? Thornton twisted towards him, seized his arm once more with a frightening urgency, and scrambled to his feet. 
comes every winter now. But it did not fall. Not then. Not here, even this far north. Ever. There was no snow when first I came here. Kermorvan's face grew suddenly grim. What is it you seek to tell me, my lord? Thornton stared out into the distances further than the trees. Can you not see? His voice grew clearer, edged now with a bitterness and desolation that tore Elof's heart. Why, it means that even a great power may be blind of what he does not wish to see. It means that even Tapayau may welter in his own self-deceiving. For all that he has done to us... He is done in the name of helping us, saving us, even if only as animals among other animals. But even in that he fails. Across his boundaries the dark trees of Taunela spread. And beyond them the barrens, the tundra, that smoothed the paths of the ice. The prince laughed again, and Elof shuddered at the sound. There is snow on the forest, where once there was none. And where the snow comes, the winters worsen. The ice caps lengthen. The snow line sinks ever lower. Cold creeps over southward. Southward, till glaciers spawn in the Meneth Aethan. Till down these very slopes they sweep, to meet their chill brethren of the north. And what of the forests then? He laughed again, but in the taut furrows of his face, tears glistened. Why did I endure to come only to this? You told me why, said Elof quietly. You told me, and I understood. To pass on the wisdom in your charge. That was your wish, and your purpose. For such a chance, if no other, you have fought to remain yourself throughout long centuries. Give us now what counsel you can. Thornton turned to gaze at him. And that chance you have made possible. Hear me then, what counsel I can give in pain and haste. You must flee. And soon, at the forest margins, its power is weakest. Join one of the hunts that is being readied. The hunt for one horns, for that will turn to the forest's northern margins. Northern? asked Ilse alarmed. Is that not the most perilous way? Aye, southward is less so, or was in my day. That is the way Lord Vade took Asse and her followers, sailing southward from Morvanic into a great bay that opens there, and thence up a river and across the margins of forest and waste. A hard route, but with fewer great perils than these trees, or the haunted swamp and barren of Tayonala. But from here the south is too far, near three times the distance, and through the forest's heart. You could never escape the Alfar, or worse sentinels. Seize what chance you have. Flee north, and follow your quest. You must come with us, said Kermorvan quietly. In the dim firelight of the forge he seemed to have grown, almost to the equal of Corentin's height. Morvan's scattered children, east or west, have need of Corentin Rudri to lead them once again. Corentin shook his head slowly, and the crown flashed and sparkled among the shadows. Not so. Not when they have Karen again. For you are more like him than I would have thought possible. Save, perhaps, that you have not yet come to believe enough in yourself. Seeing you... I can believe in truth that the river does cast us up upon its shores once again. And so, perhaps, the fear of it, the avoiding of it, is a cheat and a deception after all. 
that is so, then perhaps we will meet once again. But not now, for I am out of my time, and strangely altered, no longer fit to wrestle within the world. That I leave to you, kinsman, descendant, brother, worthy bearer of our name, to you and these friends who follow you, valiant and wise. Do you succeed where we have failed, and my blessing upon you? Kermorvan knelt before him, and Cornton raised him and embraced him. In the turmoil of his heart, Elof stepped forward, and he also bowed his head and knelt. I ask no blessing, my lord, only your justice and your forgiveness, if you can spare it. For the deception I wrought upon you, and the cruel pain I cost you. But you know why these things had to be. Then Elof looked up into Corrington's eyes, and felt sick and faint at the torment he saw there a mind rent asunder in its struggle to be free. I know none better, said the prince, and that same air that Kermorvan bore, of justice and judgment out of the deeps of time, seemed to settle upon him. You are clear-sighted, young smith. You have wisdom and power beyond your years. You have done a deed few, if any, master smiths of my own time could have equaled. Do you yourself think it master's work? Unable to look away from those agonized eyes, Elof nodded. Aye, Lord, for it was as I planned it from the start, the virtues I set in it harnessed and controlled. But it cost me dear. Then for that said Cornton sternly, as was a prince's right of old, I name you now a smith born, made, and proven, a master of your guild and mystery. Arise, master smith, and prosper. Elof stumbled up, startled, and felt Cornton's hard hand on his shoulder. And for that deed I hold you quit of the ill you have done me. But hear the doom I lay upon you in requital. For you have also a gift for cunning and ruthlessness. Already it has served you ill, and may do so again. As well that you and the others should be warned. So, from this day forth you shall bear the name... Elof Valentor, which may mean the skilled hand, but also the hand hidden. Bear it with honor, but do not forget the shame, and bear it with my blessing. Elof swallowed, though his mouth was dry. Lord, I will. May I never value mastery greater than the mastery of myself and the truest desire of my heart. Cornton nodded. So be it. Then he stepped back suddenly, and stared out of the forest, turned all to white beneath the rising moon, and spoke softly. And farewell, all. To you, Smith, so wise, yet unknown even to yourself. You, strong craftsman, worthy citizen, you, princess of our elder kin, you, warrior who could be a king in the full flower of your youth and strength, see how it ends. Think on me. And with clawed hands he tore the helm from his head and hurled the heavy thing the length of the forge to crash and roll among the coals of the hearth fire. Rock, with a cry, reach for the tongs, but Elof waved him back and shook his head, and his voice was bitter with grief and disgust. Let it melt. When they looked back, Thornton was gone. His long paces in the snow led back to the castle, but that night they saw him there no more. 
and in the dawning he was gone, departed as he had planned to with the westward hunt. And whether the prince ever came back to the halls of summer, they never knew, for no mortal man looked upon Corentin Rudry again. <laughs>